Proverbs 17, verse 10. It says in Proverbs uh, chapter 17, verse 10, Rebuke is more effective for a wise man than a hundred blows on a fool. Rebuke is more effective for a wise man than a hundred blows on a fool. Wow. Think about that verse for a moment, what it's actually saying. There's a type of person that you could take them a big stick when they've done something wrong and you can beat them a hundred times. But in the end, it will have no effect. But there's another person, you just speak a word to them to correct them where they're wrong and they immediately respond just to the word. You just speak a word and they immediately ch repent or confess or change their behavior, or whatever it may be. But there's another person that words have no meaning. You take this biggest rod. I mean, when the Bible talks about a rod, it's like a big, maybe like a, just a big, heavy stick. A hundred times. And there's no effect. What's the difference? between these two persons, between these two people. The hardness of the heart. The hardness of the heart. And I just want you to think about this for a moment. Which one are you? So, according to this verse, you're either a wise man or you're a fool. Right? There's, only, there's no in-between. You're either a wise man or you're a fool. The wise man is like what? You're told once and you respond. You do it. You're sensitive. You're, you're, your heart is sensitive. You're, you're willing to change. You want to do the right thing. And when you're told, when you're corrected, when you're, you're sent in the right direction, you immediately respond. And you do it. I mean, this could be in school with your teacher giving instructions. It could be with your parents telling you what they want you to do. It could be according to the, what the Word of God tells you to do and what you've heard in preaching and your response to that. I remember when I was a kid, my parents had this phrase they used to always say. I hated it. Do what you're told when you're told. Uh, there might have been more to it. That that's the only part I remember. Do what you're told when you're told. What do we like to say? We don't like to say, we won't say no, but we'll say maybe later. Later, not now. No, no. Do what you're told when you're told. But I was a fool. I really was. I was a fool. I was not a wise man. So I would always fight with them. I would resist them. I would not want to do what they told me to do. Why? Because my heart was hard. I was a fool. My little sister, I hated her. Why? Because she would do what she was told when she was told and wouldn't fight. Just very docile, very submissive, very sweet. And here I am just mean and hard. My brothers also, we were all like that, rebellious. We hated our little sister because she was always so obedient. We were not. Well, she was wise. We were fools. What's the difference? The hardness of the heart. So, do you have to be told the same thing over and over again? Do you have to be punished over and over again? How many times do you need to hear the gospel message before you actually respond to it? The Word of God? before you actually do what it says? You know what determines that, right? It's not logic. It's not if you're smart, intelligent, high IQ or not. It's the hardness or softness of your heart. That's my question for you tonight. I want to ask you, be honest with yourself. Are, is your heart hard or is your heart soft? 
And we say, well, how do I know? Well, do you, do you do what you're told when you're told? Or do you fight it? Do you resist it? When you hear the word of God, do you understand it and obey it? Remember the soils uh, talking about different people's hearts? There was one that was hard, really hard. And it was the path and the seed would fall on the path and the birds would come and eat it up. They would not even go into the ground. Is that like you? That you hear the message of the gospel, you hear the word of God, but it doesn't go into your heart. It only goes into your mind and goes in one ear and out the other, as we say. What would the problem be? Is it you're like mentally retarded? Is it that your brain's not? No, it's your heart. It's hard. There's a spiritual stubbornness, a spiritual blindness, and that's what's going to determine in the end, are you saved or not? If you have a hard heart and you keep a hard heart, Remember, like, you've heard me, and you've heard me preach a lot of sermons. Um, some of them have been very, very strong about the terror of God, the fear of God, the righteousness of God, the eternal judgment of God, how, how serious God is about sin, and, and how he demands us to repent immediately. The, all these sorts of things, the wrath of God, the lake of fire, eternity separated from God, no second chances, nothing but torment and torture. Um, and then we've talked about s specific sins. We've talked about honoring your mother and your father and dishonoring your mother and father. We've talked about um, many different um, specific sins of lust, of whatever it may be. Well, my question is this. When you heard all that, did it make you afraid? Did it shake you somehow on the inside? Does it move you in your heart? Or does it just kind of sound like, okay, pastor seems very excited tonight. I had people come to me when they heard me preaching. Maybe I was by, anointed by the Holy Spirit and I preached with a real passion, a real fire. And afterwards, they don't know the Holy Spirit. They just think it's me getting excited. They don't know it. I'm not, that's not me. That's the Spirit of the Holy Spirit of God speaking through a human vessel. And so they say, oh, you were very excited this morning when you preached. What are you talking about? Don't you know that God was speaking? Don't you know that that's the Holy Spirit of God? It's not me. It's not Rory Butler. It's the Spirit of God speaking through a man, speaking to you. But they had no ears to hear it, no eyes to see it, no heart to feel it or perceive it. So all they saw was a guy up here excited. If that's all you see, it's because your heart is hard. If when you hear me or, um, you know, saying all the strict things, the strong things, or being very strong, and you think, oh, that's just Rory, that's just me, when I'm sitting down with you, is that how I am? Is that how I talk to people normally? Or, you will go to hell. No, that's not how we talk to people. That's not how we speak. That's not how we act. That's the, so we see it happen, but we don't perceive it. Why? Because our heart is hard. We don't feel it. We don't understand what's happening. We're maybe a little shocked, but we don't know what it is. There's like a a mind that doesn't see, doesn't perceive. It's amazing to me how it's possible in the Bible to see Jesus in, be right in front of him, see his face, and call him the devil. But it's possible. How could that be? What was wrong with the Pharisees? Their hearts were hard. Is your heart hard? You know, there's another type. You say, well, yes, I feel it. Thank God my heart's not hard. Wait a minute. Not so fast. Yeah, you felt it. It's not the question if you felt it when it was spoken. 
Because remember Pharaoh? Remember when Moses went to Pharaoh and all the signs and the wonders he did? In the end, Pharaoh was weakened. And he said, yes, Moses, uh, pray to God for me. We'll let your people go. And what would happen afterwards? Did he do it or not? He did not do it. So he was, it seemed like he was finally broken. No, he wasn't. It says, and Pharaoh hardened his heart. And even though in a moment he felt weak, in a moment he felt moved, in a moment he felt like, I will obey God, I will repent, pray to God for me. Yes, for a moment. But the next moment, what happened? His heart went right back to the way it was. He hardened his heart. And he continued to disobey God. That's something you have to ask yourself. Especially when we have a special thing like going to the beach last Friday and we have these special times of preaching and praying and things like that. And you feel moved or whatever. You know, it's great to have those events. We want to do them again in the future. But it's not enough to feel something while you're there and leave it there and come home and just do things the way you did the same, the same as before. And you know what that means? It means you're just like Pharaoh. You hardened your heart. Do you know it's possible for you to harden your heart? You know, I've hardened my heart many times in the past. Before I was a Christian, especially even after I was a Christian. That's the scary thing. So if you have no feeling, I want you to be honest. You've heard all this preaching. You've, had, you've experienced all these things. You never felt it. Never felt the power of it. Never felt the severity of it. Never felt the seriousness of it. Never saw the glory of it. You never thought, wow, that's good. You never felt in your heart drawn by it. You never felt attracted by it. You never felt like, wow, this is real. This is true. This is good. You never felt it. You never experienced. You never tasted it. Your heart's hard. That's a hard heart. Blind eyes. Unopened hardened heart. Or if you felt it, maybe you felt it many times. But as far as your behavior is concerned, you never changed. You always kept doing the same thing. What does that mean? Same thing. Hard heart. So that's the question for us tonight. A rebuke is more effective for a wise man than a hundred blows on a fool. God have mercy that we would have that we would not have hard hearts, but we would be able to just hear it and respond and understand. Let's turn to Exodus. Chapter 19. Verse 1. In the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. For they had departed from Rephidim and come to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the children of Israel. So, remember, this is after God brought um, Israel out of Egypt. And now he brought him into the wilderness. He brought him before Mount Sinai. And he's already brought them out. He's done all these things. But what he wants to do is take them to the next level. He wants to make them become his special people. He wants to establish a covenant with them. And so he's brought them to this moment so he can have an official, formal covenant with him. It's like this. It's like maybe you, there's a, a, a man, a boy and a girl. They're in love with each other. They're boyfriend and girlfriend, but they're not married. 
So there has to be a marriage, and then they're officially together for life. So here, God has already revealed himself to Israel. He's already worked on their behalf, but they need to have a covenant, a formal covenant, a lifelong, eternal agreement between them. And he wants to make them a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So it's a very special thing. And um, in verse 7, So Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before them all these words which the Lord had, which the Lord commanded him. Then all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. So Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in the thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. So the people agreed to the covenant. Moses went back to the Lord, and so the Lord is setting this up. So Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. Then the Lord said to Moses, now this is important. This is what I want us to see here. The Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Let them wash their clothes and let them be ready for the third day. Okay, so he's having them wash themselves, wash their clothes, prepare themselves for what's going to happen. Well, what's going to happen? Well, it's going to be like the, the wedding, right? The, the covenant is going to be established. And, and look, look what he says. Let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. What's going to happen? God's going to come down and reveal himself. They're going to, in some way, they're going to see God, at least a manifestation of God. They're going to hear God audibly, and they're going to see something. God is going to come so near to them, something that's never happened before since the Garden of Eden. Now, listen to what he says. The the instructions he gives that follows are, are really important. You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Why not go up to the mountain? Because God's going to come down on that mountain, okay? God's going to come down on the mountain so they cannot touch it. They can't even go close to it. Whoever, listen to what he says here. Take heed to yourselves that you do not go up the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death, Not a hand shall touch him. Listen, if somebody dares to go up to the mountain where God is going to come on, where God's going to come down, they must die. And not only that, listen, they must die, but when you kill them, you can't even touch them. You have to use um, rocks, stones, or arrows to kill them. Because God is so holy... Nobody can come near to him. Nobody. Nobody can come near the mountain. This is a big problem. It's a big problem. What's the problem? God wants them to be his own people, but if he comes just as he is and and lives and dwells in their midst, they will all instantly die. They will die. If God comes down without any restraints, without any restrictions, just as he is in the midst of the people of Israel, they will all immediately die. This is a big problem. God is absolutely, completely holy. God is absolutely, entirely powerful with absolutely no inability whatsoever. God is holy, uncreated, glorious. If he comes down, they will die because they are sinners. Sinners. 
For the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Take heed to yourselves that you do not go up the mountain or touch its base. Or, he doesn't say, or you're going to get in trouble with your parents. No, he says you're going to die. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch him. Don't even come near him. Don't even come near God. You'll die as well. But he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow. Whether man or beast, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come near the mountain. So now, can you imagine how they're feeling now? Uh, I'm not sure if I want to do this. I didn't realize it was so serious. I didn't realize it was a life or death issue. I mean, when our God said he's going to come down on a mountain, I thought that would be great. We'll see like a rainbow. We'll see something really like a dove floating in the air. We'll see, no, 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 no. It's going to be something terrifying because he's coming in his glory. And it's so serious, so severe, if you even touch the mountain that he's coming down on, you must be killed. So, verse 14, So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not come near your wives. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud. Some trumpet sound. It's not a man. It's a supernatural. There's, a, it's a, there's thunderings. There's lightnings. There's thick clouds. There's this loud trumpet. Now the people are getting nervous. Okay. Now people are freaking out. And it says, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Even Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and shaking with fear. Even Moses, the one who God had been speaking all these messages to, who should have understood a little bit more about God, even he was absolutely terrified. And Mo Moses, verse 17 Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Can you imagine how they felt? They must have felt absolutely helpless. We could die. We don't know what's going to happen. There is a power at work here that's beyond anything, beyond the weather. Beyond, there's a supernatural power. It's God. The living God is revealing himself. And now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke. Why? Because the Lord descended upon it in fire. O oh Lord, our God is a consuming fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace. The whole mountain quaked greatly. Now God is revealing Himself. He came down as a fire. There actually is a mountain in that area. I don't know if it's the same one or not. But it looks, the whole thing you can see in the photo, it looks like it's been burned up. Burned, just burned by fire. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain. Look at this. 
And the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And when he got up there, the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people. This is how serious it is. This is how serious it is. They've already warned the people. And Moses goes all the way to the top of the mountain to meet with God. And when he gets up there, God says, go back down. Warn the people, lest they break through to gaze at the Lord and many of them perish. Why is there a smoke and a fire? If God appears as he is, they will die. They will die. Also let the priests who come near the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. It means kill them. Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you warned us, saying, Set bounds around the mountain and consecrate it. Then the Lord said to him, Away, get down, and then come up, you and Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and spoke to them. I want to say to you tonight, this God that appeared on Mount Sinai, the fear that they felt, it's the same God we worship. It's the same God we believe in. And if you meet God, you also will fear. Turn to... Revelation chapter 1. The Bible says very clearly, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. To know the Lord is to fear the Lord. If you have no fear of God in you, you're not afraid of God at all, you have no sense of the fear of God, it is because you are completely deceived in your mind. You hear me? If you have no fear of the consequences of sin, you have no fear that God will will judge you. You have no fear that God will take you and cast you into hell. You have no fear that your actions will bring terrible consequences. You, You have no fear of God. It's, it's because in your mind, you're completely deceived. You're completely blinded, and your heart is hard. If, you don't, if you've not struggled with the things you've heard, if you've not struggled with the message that you've been hearing, you've not struggled with your sins, struggled with repenting, struggling with thinking about there's a hell, there's eternal life, and there's hell, and there's a judgment. You've not struggled with these. You've not, it's not struck your heart. It's not, it's not brought you to a place of fear and trembling. It's because you're completely deceived. You don't know the truth. You're blinded. You're not smart. You're dumb. You're not wise. You're a fool. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If we meet God, if God reveals Himself to us, we will fear Him. If there's no fear of Him, within us. We only think of God in terms of, in fact, we can even tell jokes about God. We can ask stupid questions about God. We don't feel afraid to ask ridiculous questions about the Bible or about God. You know why? You don't fear God. You're completely um, blinded. You know, if, if Israel, before they experienced all these things, like in Egypt, with all the plagues, and before they went to Mount Sinai, they were just like us. They didn't know anything about God. They knew there's a God. They believed the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? 
They knew there was a God, but they never had met God. God had never moved in their life. He'd never touched their heart. They never experienced him. So, so they were as hard as a rock. Their hearts were as hard as a rock. But when God came near to them, when God revealed himself to them, now they are afraid. Now they are shaky. Now they're crying. Now they don't know what to do. Why? Because God is absolutely, perfectly holy. And he's absolutely, perfectly powerful. And we are absolutely, perfectly sinful. Absolutely lost. Absolutely naked in his sight with nothing to cover us, nothing to justify us, nothing to excuse ourselves. When the light of God, when God comes near, when the searching light of God comes, you realize I cannot hide from God. And all my attempts have been utter foolishness. All my attempts to push it away, all my attempts to not think about it and think it will stop it, it was absolutely, it was worse than insanity. You're worse than an insane man who thinks he can drink poison every day when he gets up in the morning and it won't affect him because he's Superman. You're more foolish than that. You're more ridiculous than that man that drinks a bottle of poison every morning. He thinks I'm Superman. It won't hurt me. No, you're going to die. You're going to die. We would think that's crazy. Yeah. but more crazy, more foolish is the one that doesn't realize God is real. God is true. God is terrifying. Consequences are eternal. It lasts forever. Sin is real. It's not just, oh, I sinned again. Oh, I'm sorry. I confess my sin. It's just like it's no, no, no. Sin is real. It's real. And it's against God. It's not that just that you failed. Oh, I tried hard, but I failed again. No, 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 no. That's not even the point. The point is you dishonored God with your body with your mind, with your thoughts, with your heart. You rebelled against God. You rose up against God. Remember in the Old Testament what happens when people rise up against God. Remember in the wilderness some people rose up against Moses, but actually they were rising up against God. You know what happened to them? The earth opened up beneath them and swallowed them alive, and their whole families, and they closed on them. They all went down to hell. Can you imagine if all of a sudden this just the floor split open and just dragged half of you down into the abyss, into the lake of fire. That's what happened to people that rise up against God, that resist God to his face, that say, no, I will not obey you. No, I will not submit to you. No, I will not uh, uh, humble myself before you. I will fight against you. I will complain against you. I, I want my way. I don't want it now. Rebel. Rebels die in the Bible. Rebels die a miserable death in the Bible. In this world, it pays to be a rebel. It's, it, it pays to be a rebel. But in the world to come, you pay with eternal hell for being a rebel. If you want to be cool in this world, be a rebel. Be different. Kind of make yourself cool and everybody will, wow, look at that guy. He's really cool. He disobeys the teacher. He disobeys the, he, the, the police. He disobe He's a cool guy. Just, oh yeah, you can, you can be a great rebel. And the world will love you. But you're going to pay for it. And God's wages are awful. Because the wages of sin is death. And that's not just physical death. That's one part of it. 
That's not the worst part. The worst part is what the Bible calls the second death. That's where your soul is cast into the lake of fire to be tortured and tormented forever. In Revelation chapter 1, John was on the island of Patmos. And he sees the Lord Jesus appear to him. In verse 12 it says, I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, that means the Lord Jesus, clothed, with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like snow, were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. This is a glorious revelation of Jesus Christ after he rose from the dead and ascended to heaven. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And look, look, look what happened to him. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. This is the God that we're talking about. I want you to understand that. This is the God that we're preaching about. This is the God that we are dealing with. This God. The one that came down on Mount Sinai in that fire, and the whole people were shaking with fear. With, if anybody even went near or touched the mountain, even an animal, it must die. And it must die in a special way. No one could even touch them. Even Moses was quaking with fear and exceedingly afraid. And here me, now we have the Apostle John who sees the Lord Jesus in his glory and cannot stand it. He falls on the ground like a dead man. This is who God is. The only reason that Moses could go up the mountain and not die is because of a special thing that God did. That, remember when Moses said, Lord, show me your glory? He said, I will show you my glory, but I have to do it a special way. Why? Because if I show you my glory, you'll die. You'll die. That's who God is. If you see him, you'll die. If he really comes near, he'll kill you. So what did God do for Moses? He had to find like a, a hole in the rock, a cleft in the rock, and hide him there, like in a, some way. It, we don't even really fully understand what happened there, but all we know is this, that God shielded Moses from God. That God had to protect Moses from God, or he would die. That was the only way Moses could possibly come near to God or see God or hear God. That's why at Mount Sinai, God appeared the way he did. They almost died. But God, he, he, he shielded them. It was a fire and it was, there was smoke. He was covering himself. They were not seeing him fully. He was not appearing in his fullness. Or they would have died. But that's who God is. We must understand the terror the Bible speaks of. Paul speaks of the terror of the Lord now motivates us, he says. Because we know we must all stand before the judgment throne of Christ. What's so terrible about that? He, Jesus is my buddy. He's just my greatest power. No, you don't even know who Jesus is if you think like that. 
I'm not, we're not denying the love. We're not denying the mercy. We're not denying the tenderness of God. But that's not the all of God. This is a foundation the whole Bible talks about of who God really is. Don't you know that's the whole problem throughout the Bible? Why did God come down in Israel and dwell in the temple and only in the Holy of Holies? That's to protect Israel from himself. Do you see the problem? What's the problem? God wants to dwell with man. God wants man to be with him. Do you understand that? That's how we were made to know God, to walk with God, to fellowship with God. But he cannot. Why? If he does, we will die. Why? Because we are so sinful. So fallen. His glory will instantly destroy us. This is the real problem in the whole Bible as far as God restoring man to himself. And in fact, it almost seems as if like there's no solution to the problem. From the perspective of man, there is no solution. The only solution to the problem is what God did for Moses. What did he do? Remember? He protected Moses from himself. God protected Moses from God. He had a way to shield him and reveal him. And what I want us to understand is that's what it means that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That God made a way to come near without killing us. When Jesus appeared on the earth, He did not appear in His glory. And, and you could say the only time maybe He kind of showed His glory, like on the Mount of Transfiguration, they freaked out. Remember that? They freaked out. They were terrified. His glory was, was veiled. There was a, God made a way so that man could come near to him without being destroyed. And what I want to say is that that's what the gospel message is. For the gospel message to make sense, you have to understand who God is and who you are. And when we look at these verses and we see what happened on Mount Sinai, we see what happened with John in the book of Revelation, we there's many other verses we could look at. We begin to understand, oh, man cannot see God. Man cannot come near to God or God will kill him. That's the issue. But if we don't have God, we are lost forever. If we cannot come near to God, then we are lost forever. There's no hope. And so the gospel is where God has made a cleft in the rock, so to speak, a place where we can be hidden and shielded by God from God so that we can know God. If you want to know God, if you want to have eternal life, you need, you must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and in His blood shed for you. That's the only hope you have. You must believe and trust who Jesus Christ is. He's the Son of God who came to save us from our sins to save us from God. God came to save us from God. And He gave His blood. There's a verse in the Bible that talks about the blood of God. 
Jesus was a man, but he was more than a man. And that is the shield from the wrath of God. That is the shield from the terror of God. That is the shelter from the judgment of God. Remember what they did in Egypt when God brought judgment on the, uh, the eldest son, on the firstborn son of all of the Egyptians? They had to sacrifice an animal, like either a goat or a lamb, and take the blood and put it above their doorposts on the top and the bottom and the sides. Because he said, because the destroyer is going to go by. and it's going to, Every house is going to be visited by the destroyer. But if I look and I see the blood, if the destroyer comes by to, re to bring judgment and sees the blood, it will pass by. You see that? God's judgment is going to come for everybody. There's no exceptions. God is absolutely just. He doesn't pick favors and say, well, this one I will judge, but this one I will not. He never does that. He never does that. He won't do it for you. He won't do it for me. But what he will do is, if there's blood on your door, he'll pass by. Because there's already been a judgment that took place. You see, that animal took the place. That animal died so that you don't have to die. That's why the Bible says, says that Jesus is the Lamb of God. Well, what, what's he dying for? Because if he doesn't, you will die. Why did Jesus face um, Pilate's judgment? They judged him. The Pharisees judged him. The, the, the temple priest and the all these people, they judged him. Pilate judged him. And God did as well. Why? Because it's either him or you. Or there will be a judgment. And so the question is, is the blood over your door? Is the blood covering your heart and your mind. There is a provision of blood. It's the blood of God. And it is the shelter. It's the hiding place. It's the refuge. It's the forgiveness. It's the mercy. It's the redemption. It's the protection from God. Isn't that amazing? It also protects from the devil. But the devil's not our worst enemy. The worst enemy of mankind is God. You realize that, that God is the enemy of this world and this world is the enemy of God? There's a mutual uh, animosity. The world does not love God, and God does not love the world. Wait, God so loved the world. Yes. Read the next part. He gave His only Son for those that believe in Him. But this world is going to face the fire of judgment. Unless what? Unless the blood is on you. You need blood that Jesus shed on your life. You need it. It's the only way of salvation. But the Bible speaks in such a way and in such an amazing way. Like, remember, you know, we looked at those verses now, the one in Exodus and the one in Revelation. And there's many more in the Bible, but it gives you a picture that God is terrifying. Well, He is. But it's not because He's bad that He's terrifying. It's because He's good. Because He's pure light. Because He's absolutely holy. He's absolute purity. There's nothing evil in Him. And when that comes close to us, who are so filthy so defiled, so unclean, it's awful. But the blood of Jesus washes away the filthiness of our sins. 
It makes us pure. If you're a Christian, you will be pure. If you're not pure, you're not a Christian. One of the things that the blood of Jesus does, of course, is it causes the destroyer to pass by. So we are free from the judgment, the wrath, right? But another thing the blood does is it purifies, it cleanses, it takes away the filthiness, it takes away the impurity and the uncleanness. So we know if there's a man who says, ha ha, I've escaped the wrath of God, I've believed in the blood of Jesus. Okay, my next question is, are you pure? The blood of Jesus saves from the wrath of God and it saves from the defilement of sin. It makes us pure. That's how we know. That's one of the main signs that we're actually a Christian. How do we know? Our heart has been changed. Now we seek purity. Before we didn't. We sought sinful things. But now we desire purity. We seek purity. You know, in the book of um, 1 John, it was written so that people would know that they have eternal life. It was written so they could judge themselves and know that they're in the faith. It was written so that they could know that they are truly the children of God. And one of the main tests, one of the main tests is the sin test. Are you living in sin or are you living in righteousness? If you're still living in sin, then you're not a child of God. If you're living in righteousness, then you are a child of God. So, I think I need to clarify that. Lest we're deceived by the devil and think, well, that means I can't go to heaven because I'm not perfect yet. No, I don't say perfect, but I say pure. It's not the same thing when we're dealing with a sinner redeemed by the blood of Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit and being changed. Being changed. Being sanctified. See, before we were not being sanctified, we were getting worse and worse. There Probably there's some of you in here and I, I pray it's not the case, and I pray it will change. I'm praying for you. But your, your path in life right now is actually, it's not to get better, it's to go down. You get worse, more sinful. That's the normal course of human life. We always get worse. The world gets worse. It gets more, technolo uh, more technology. In that sense, it gets better. But the sin becomes more. I forgot who I was talking to the other day, but I was having the conversation where I was so shocked I think one of the main signs that we are really at the end of the world, I don't know how long, but I, I believe that we are at the end of the world as we know it, that the Lord Jesus will return soon. And I believe the main, the main sign is not even the coronavirus. That's a sign, obviously, but it's not, I don't think the main one. The main one is this, how much wickedness is all over the face of the earth. The wickedness is so awful. And just in America alone, where if you watch the news, the media, all these things, the, the, the famous people, the politicians, they make evil things good, and they make good things evil. They say things like homosexuality, being a banshee, transgenderism, all these things are good. But believing in normal marriage, believing in a man and a woman, and believing in God, and going to church, and reading the Bible, that's all bad evil. They've completed the mindset. It's not only America. It's all over the world. All over the world. The, the sin is so rampant. I mean, just the, the question of abortion, killing a baby in the womb. My goodness. And we talk about like all the people that died under Hitler, or even all the people that died in the in the Wenge, or the, the Da Yue Jin, or whatever. Um, that's not even close to all the people that died from abortion. All the babies, innocent babies, little girls, little boys, just 
ripped out of their mother's womb and killed, murdered. Millions and millions and millions and millions in every nation on the earth. You know, in the Bible, the one thing that, well, not the one thing, but one of the main things that provokes God to wrath and judgment is what? The shedding of innocent blood. Two things, I would say. Three things, maybe. The shedding of innocent blood, homosexuality, sexual immorality, and idolatry. And the world is absolutely filled with, to the point now, like if I compare, I'm, I'm 45, so I'm not 80. There's a difference. But I'm 45, so I've lived quite a while, I guess. The world has changed so much from the time when I was your age. It's almost unbelievable. It's absolutely changed. And I ask my parents, who are in their 70s, closer to 80 almost, I think. And, and they say, they lived much longer than me, and they say, it's never been like it is now. Something happened. It's different. The generation that we're in, I believe, is the most wicked generation that's ever been on the face of the earth. The most wicked. I mean, People have always been sinners. There's always been a lot of sin. But I believe it's worse now than it ever has been before. And it's getting worse by day. How many of you have a cell phone? We all have cell phones. Do you realize how dangerous this thing is? Do you realize that the touch of a finger, it's possible to be exposed to the most vile, demonic, twisted, perverted of any sort, of any sort, in seconds, you can be demon-possessed through your cell phone. In seconds, you can immerse your spirit in the devil himself, whether that be through sexual immorality, whether that be some form of satanic thing, any sort of thing right there. Right there. And you all have it in your hand. It's like you have the devil in your pocket. You should be afraid. If you're not afraid of this thing, then you're a fool. I'm afraid of it. I'm afraid of the computer. I'm careful. Why? Because I know the evil that's there. Right there. How close it is. If you're not afraid of this thing, you think of it as just like a game or a toy or a core, then you are blind. There's been many times in my life where I wish I did not have a computer and I did not have a phone. I'd much rather not have a phone or a computer. Why? Because I'm afraid of these things. Because I know what's there. Satan is right there. Right there. This is the generation that you live in. When I was your age, it wasn't like that. When I was a young sinner, there was no internet pornography, there was no internet. There was ways where we could see stuff, but it wasn't like so easy. There was ways you could be exposed to bad things, but it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. I thank God for his protection over my life. You're in great danger because if you expose yourself to those things now, it will haunt you the rest of your life. Well, but I'll repent. You'll repent. But it will haunt you the rest of your life. You can't just go and do something today and just say, oh, I'm sorry tomorrow, and it's done. No, no, no. no. 
when you expose yourself to certain things, especially things like pornography, you're opening your soul. Do you understand that? You're opening up your spirit to demons. To demons. Not just to pictures. Demons. And you can't just say, oh, I close it now, it's done, and it's gone. No, it doesn't work like that. It allows stuff into your life. It allows stuff into your soul, into your spirit, into your mind. Do you know that I have images in my mind or pictures that want to come into my mind from 30 years ago that I have to fight sometimes? I will not allow that thought in my mind. This is serious stuff. It's not a game. Serious stuff. There is literally, literally, God have mercy. When I was young, your age, things that I looked at, that I saw, that if I'm not careful, the devil will still try to bring that into my mind today. I have to fight sometimes. If it, I just I have to push, I have to intentionally keep it out of my mind. So if you look at a, a thousand things, a million things, do you realize you are absolutely programming yourself to go to hell? What do you mean? to? Go? Because you're putting all the seeds of sin in your heart. You say, well, but I'll repent later. You put seeds for the, next, for the rest of your life. Seeds. And open doors to the devil. You're giving access to the demons by the simple things you watch on YouTube. It's actually a fact. I'm not exaggerating. This is the truth. You're staining your soul. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's a real blood. It's a serious blood. It's a powerful blood. It's a blood that doesn't just cover your sins. It washes them away and it takes them out. But you cannot go And you will have to walk a strict path the rest of your life or you will fall. I urge you guys, treat this thing like a nuclear bomb. that has the power to detonate and destroy your life at any moment. It's a fact. You say, oh, I won't bother me. That's what you think now. Because you're still young and you don't have a lot of experience. And you think things are very simple and no, they're not. Life is real. Sin is real. And it has awful consequences. I would urge you guys, if you're struggling in any of these sorts of areas, that you do everything you possibly can to repent and get free now. No matter what you have to do, no matter who you have to talk to, no matter what level you have to go to, do not stay in sin. You're destroying your soul for life and eternity. Do everything you can. Humble yourself. Get help. Get free. Get clean. And get to the cross where the blood of Jesus was poured out like a fountain to bring cleansing of sin. These are the sins that we must have cleansed. And it's not just one 
time thing, one thing we did one time, it's something that becomes a part of your nature. God, have mercy. There's been a few times over the years in my life as a Christian where God has given me dreams or he spoke to me in a dream. And I remember one dream in particular. It was one of the most terrifying things in my life. In the dream, I was sitting down in my, my house where, my, where I grew up. I was in front of a TV. And I was about, or I was in the middle of watching some bad things. And right at that moment, it was like God came. And the terror. And I mean, at that, some reason, at that, ta- at that moment, my mom's voice, my mom came as well. Glory, what are you doing? And I realized in the dream that I became a monster. What do I mean by that? Through watching those filthy things, I became a monster. A slave of sin, every sort of uncleanness, every sort of wicked, lustful thing. But it was a warning from God. It was a strong warning from God. If you touch that stuff, that's what you will become. And so will you. So will you. Maybe nobody knows about it your whole life, but God knows who you really are. He knows you're filthy. He knows you're vile. He knows you're unclean. You're absolutely perverted in your thoughts and the things that you think about and the things that you look at. But what, you're, what, 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 what I saw in that dream and what I'm trying to communicate to you tonight is you will actually become more like a demon than a person. You will become more depraved. You become twisted. You can't control it. If you touch that stuff, you give it power over you. And you will be formed into the image of the devil. It's absolutely sick. It should cause us to shake with fear because it's possible it could happen to anyone. What can take away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We need the blood of Jesus. Do you have the blood of Jesus covering your door? Will the destroyer pass you by. Well, sometimes I'm afraid, okay? Maybe you're not sure, okay? It's possible to have doubts, but to actually be a child of God. What what about your life? Is your life pure? Is there purity in you? Is the Holy Spirit working purity in your life? I don't say that you're you're 100% or you're perfect, but is the Holy Spirit working purity in your heart? Working purity purity in your life. That's the test. Do you love to come to church? Do you love other Christians? Do you live in sin? Or have you turned away from sin? 
and are now pursuing purity and holiness. Is there a new nature within you? Is there like a new person living inside of you with a new desire that you didn't have before, with a, with a, with a new attitude that you didn't have before, that something new, a new life, like a new person came and moved in? Do you have this new nature? If you don't, you better get it. You must have it. You need the blood of Jesus to cover you. You need the blood of Jesus to cleanse you. And you need the Spirit of God to recreate you and give you a new heart. If you hear the Word of God and understand it, you will be afraid. If God reveals Himself to you, to your heart, to your mind, to your spirit, you will tremble. There's no bifa. There's no other way. No, there's no other way that you can truly come to God without being afraid. Why? Because He's terrifying. Because He's so pure and so holy and we're so sinful. But He has made a way of peace. He's made peace by the blood of His cross. And that's where we can know God. That's where we can hide in God, from God. That's where we can be covered, sheltered, like Moses in the rock. Are you in the, the shelter? Are you in that crevice? Are you in that cleft? Are you being hidden by God, protected by God from God? Or are you fully exposed, like all Israel, standing before the mountain? And the only thing that's holding back destruction is that God is restraining himself. You're, you may be safe temporarily because God is restraining himself. But it won't last forever. You must get cleansed in the blood. You must hide yourself from the wrath of Almighty God. Where do I hide? How can I hide from the wrath of Almighty God? His eyes go to and fro throughout the earth. He sees everyone. Ever. Yes, hide in his son. Hide in his son. Hide in the wounds of the Lamb. That's the only safe place. You can go there tonight. If you're not there, you can go there tonight. There is a door that is opened. There is a fountain provided for all who are thirsty. There is a door that has been opened, a safe place. You can come, but you must come. If you're not there, then come tonight. And be shielded, be sheltered, be washed, be cleansed, be forgiven, and be made a new creature.